Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Active Shooter Preparedness for Facility Managers. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. I'm Ann Cosgrove, the Editor-in-Chief of Facility Executive Magazine, and this webinar is presented by ARC Facilities. Prevention, protection, mitigation, response, and recovery. Each phase is crucial to emergency preparedness for extreme violence events at your facilities. And facility management and their teams have an important role in every phase of preparedness. So today's webinar is presented by Dave Hunt, an international expert in the field of active assailant emergency response, and he will be presenting to you for the, uh, for the next 60 minutes or so. Before we get started, I would like to cover a few housekeeping items. Please note the control panel on your screen. This is where you can submit questions in the question box in that panel. You can send your questions in at any time, and these will be addressed after the presentation. Also, please note the orange arrow on the left side of your panel. Clicking on that will either expand or collapse the panel, so please be sure it is expanded, and you can send your questions via that box. Also, if at any time you experience a technical difficulty, you can send a message to us in that section, and someone will answer you privately. If you are interested in continuing education credits, please note you'll receive a certificate of attendance and an email from facility executive after this webinar, and you can report to your association for those CEUs. Now, I would like to introduce your speakers before we begin with the presentation. Dave Hunt is an international expert in the field of emergency response with a 32-year background in law enforcement, terrorism response, fire, arson, explosives investigation, hazardous materials response, and emergency medical response. He has worked in every area of national response guidance, including developing a nationwide threat assessment tool with the FBI. Over the past five years, Dave led the effort to develop and deliver a completely revised active shooter preparedness curriculum for the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. He served as lead instructor for the program and hosted a recent Department of Homeland Security 96-minute video, Active Shooter Preparedness Emergency Planning. Dave is a certified protection professional, and he was recently selected to serve on the technical committee to revise the national standard for workplace violence prevention and intervention and to develop an active assailant incident annex. He recently worked on the after action report for the Las Vegas, Nevada shooting, and is currently working with the Federal Aviation Administration to revise its active shooter and extreme workplace violence preparedness. You'll also hear from Todd Moore of ARC Facilities this afternoon, later in the presentation. Todd is Senior Solutions Architect with ARC Facilities, with ARC, and he advises and educates facility professionals across the education, healthcare, manufacturing, and government sectors on how technology can transform uh, their operations. Todd's a frequent presenter at both national and regional events with trade organizations such as IFMA, ASHI, and others. So now I will hand, hand it over to Dave, and uh, we'll jump right in. Hi, Dave. Welcome. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, Ann. I want to quickly uh, go over what we're going to be covering. We want to talk about what is the threat, and most people will consider it active shooter, which is a very narrowly defined threat. So we'll expand and broaden that a little bit, provide some background. I want to cover what are the legal requirements, what standards are there that are out there that are relevant, and what does OSHA have to say that we need to do. And then I want to get into prevention. Uh, our first choice, obviously, is pre preventing incidents rather than having to respond. So what are the what are the elements associated with prevention and where does facility management fit into some of that? And then preparedness, obviously a much greater role for, for facility management. We wanna talk about uh, what do we do to uh, conduct risk assessments for our facilities? What are some of the options in terms of physical security? Uh, how do we you know, put this into plans? What training needs to occur? And then how do we exercise these capabilities? So I wanna look at three different areas. One is the individual preparedness, which we need to make sure that employees are all trained on recognition of behaviors that would indicate someone may be on a pathway to violence. They need to know how to report that. And they also need personal protective action training, which we'll get more into a little later. The organization is where we're gonna focus most of our time today. And what do we need to do at the organizational level to uh, prepare for an incident, uh, to prevent the incidents, and then respond and recover from incidents uh, should they occur. And then the community, we're gonna focus today primarily on the intersection between emergency responders and the uh, uh, facility staff, who's going to be a liaison with emergency responders, what do they need to do, what pre preparation needs to happen to do that. And the last one I want to emphasize is the need to include persons with disabilities, access and functional needs uh, in your planning process. Don't plan about them without them. Uh, make sure that your plans address their specific needs, which include notification issues, supervision issues, and mobility issues, and we'll get more into that a little bit later as well. What is an active shooter? Well, the federal definition is pretty broad. It says an individual engaged in killing or attempting to kill people in a populated area. Well, that means that's 
it's a lot of different uh, shooting incidents. Key with uh, active shooter in the federal definition is there's often no pattern or method to their selection of victims. So if someone were to come into your workplace, kill their boss, kill three coworkers, and then themselves, that's not an active shooter incident. Um, and it's not gonna be classified as such by the federal government. So most shootings are not classified. Uh, they may be domestic violence, which we're seeing on the uptick now, drug activity, gang activities, you know, criminal incidents, or even terrorism. None of those are gonna be classified. So even though there is what, you know, a 400% increase from 2000 when we saw about six incidents a year classified as an active shooter to approximately 24 per year now, um, that's still only 24 incidents in a year in the United States. And we know there's a lot more shootings than that, um, you know, in an average weekend in, in some of the major cities. So um, that's part of the issue. So what we want to do is to try to expand the terms beyond that. Uh, recognition that uh, there's approximately two workplace homicides every workday in the United States. Most of these we never ever hear about uh, for exactly the reasons we discussed. They're, they're not, um, you know, spectacular. The media doesn't, uh, doesn't fit their narrative. They're not going to hear about it. So the, some of the terms we talk about using is extreme workplace violence or active assailant because we're finding that a lot of these incidents are being conducted with weapons other than guns. So hatchets, machetes, knives, uh, explosives, vehicles, you name it. Uh, so we need to kind of broaden our concept and extreme workplace violence seems to hit that. But the question is, where are these incidents occurring? And uh, approximately uh, 70 some percent are occurring where we work or where we go to school. Uh, government, military, approximately 10%. Houses of worship, I think is up around four or 5% now, a little bit uptick in that. This is an older uh, slide, it's difficult to get coalish, uh, uh, collated information out of the FBI. And then healthcare, about 2.5%. So big, big areas here are uh, facilities that you all are likely to be in, in uh, managing. So what types of workplace violence do we have? Type one is essentially um, people who commit crimes that have no prior affiliation with their organization. So it may be a bank robbery, uh, stop and rob, something like that could even be a, a terrorism incident. If we think about recent incidents uh, such as the Walmart in El Paso, the individual went there because he thought they would find Hispanic people that they wanted to kill. Think about the church shooting in Charleston uh, where the individual went to the African-American church to commit their killing. A uh, person had no prior affiliation with the organization there. That's about 1% uh, of all workplace violence incidents. Type 2 is violence directed at employees by customers, think writ large, so clients, patients, students, inmates, um, anybody you provide services for. Uh, we find that that is approximately 12% of the incidents that are out there. Type three is what we normally think about, violence against coworkers, supervisors, uh, by a present or former employee. And here we're talking almost two thirds of the incident, over 60% of the incidents are related to that. And may, many people will tell you that the hardest one to prevent and, and predict is the, the insider threat. And I would argue just the opposite. These are the people that you can see on a daily basis that may be having difficulty coping with the stressors in their lives that may be uh, you know, uh, exhibiting behaviors that would be uh, indicating to us they're on a pathway to violence. And we get down to type four, which is violence committed in the workplace by someone who doesn't work there, but has a personal relationship. Uh, so this is our domestic violence spilling over to the workplace. And there's two elements here that I want to emphasize. One is it's becoming far more prevalent. One in three women, one in six men in their lifetime may be involved in a domestic violence relationship. Um, and the other thing that we think about is that, well, it's really not our problem. Uh, I'm sorry you're having trouble at home, but, you know, that doesn't affect me. Uh, well, the answer is it does, because the person who uh, is losing control in this relationship may not know if the other is sleeping tonight, but they know where they work. And they're also likely convinced themselves that coworkers have convinced the individual to leave them. So now you as coworkers are all targets of this potential uh, threat as well. The other thing we found in this arena, <clears throat> excuse me, is the, the change of what is considered a personal relationship or domestic partner. It used to be husband and wife and then domestic partners. And now there's all kinds of relationships that are out there. And we're also finding that in the, the social dating you know, arena of all these different dating apps, 
people will communicate for a couple of weeks and then you know uh, take the risk of going on a date and some of these people uh, have just assumed that after the first date they they own this other person and have just become um, you know uh, fanatical about uh, basically trying to control that individual so we've seen a, a significant change in these types of incidents uh, these are now now up over 20 uh, percent 22 23 percent the latest thing so give you an idea of where these incidents are coming from. So guidance and oversight, there's two primary areas. One is the OSHA general duty clause, which says employers have to provide a place of employment free from recognizable hazards, keyword recognizable hazards, that are likely to cause or cause, likely or causing or likely to cause death or serious harm. And the, the key word here is uh, recognizable hazard. Uh, that has been expanded by some courts to include uh, active shooter or uh, extreme violence uh, circumstances where employees, employers should be recognizing uh, a duty to uh, prevent, prevent and protect their employees from that. The other primary piece of uh, guidance on this is the American National Standard, originally put out at the end of 2011 by the American Society for Industrial Security and the Society for Human Resource Management. Uh, this was um, is currently being updated. Uh, SHRM is no longer a standards um, organization, uh, but ASIS is in the process of updating this and including an active assailant annex for that. Uh, while this is not legally required, there's two, complete, two, two elements here. One is that OSHA has been using the American National Standard as a guidance tool uh, when they come in following a workplace homicide to examine uh, what the organization has done to prevent and protect employees from that. Um, and it's important that you see that it's well it may not be uh, legally required it is a duty of care uh, standard of care that's that's out there it's very important so what does it say we need to do well there's five different tiers the first one is you've got to have plans policies and procedures and not just ones that say we don't tolerate workplace violence well that's nice what are you doing about it what does your plan say how are you addressing that how are you preventing it how are you responding uh, what's the what's your your you know, your entire uh, policies and procedures say? Tier two is looking at providing baseline employees a uh, baseline training to all employees, looking at recognition of what are the behaviors that people exhibit that may be on a pathway, how to report it. Some companies are including uh, basic de-escalation training for their employees, and they're also including personal protective actions training, run hide fight or similar type of training that's tailored to that facility. Uh, as we go up from there, look at managers and supervisors. They need to have not only the same baseline training, but greater de-escalation uh, capability. They also need to know how to appropriately intervene. And if they don't feel comfortable in the intervention or don't feel that it's going well, uh, then they need to be able to interface with the threat management team. Uh, what are they, uh, you know, so how do they escalate this issue? So the tier four is the threat management team and crisis management team level, where we're looking at trying to make sure that organizations have a multidisciplinary team of people from uh, HR, facilities, IT, security, you name it, um, that have put together a team that has outside training, a key issue in the national standard, um, to understand how to analyze the threat and how to develop and implement an appropriate intervention strategy. And then there's the follow-on for that. The other half of this is crisis management teams need to be able to not only manage the incident occurring at a facility level, but also look at how they would manage the impact to the enterprise level of the incident occurring. And then the executive team needs to basically have the, the oversight and the, the authority to they have the authority. They need to be able to implement this plan in a holistic fashion to provide the support for plans, policies, procedures, training, threat management teams and exercises to evaluate this. So those are the key elements that are required under the American National Standard. I want to move into prevention. So how do we recognize uh, people that may be on this pathway to violence? And it's important to note that we are not profiling anybody. There is no valid profile of an active shooter. You know, we can say that 96% of them are male, uh, but you can't say because you're a male, you're an active shooter. Um, same thing when we look at uh, mental health issues. Uh, a lot of the people who are active shooters have mental health issues, but you can't say people who have mental health issues are likely to become active shooters. So there is no way to, to look at um, 
identifying people. Uh, that way we've got to look at the behaviors that they would exhibit that would indicate they're having difficulty coping. It's important to have a positive culture for reporting. Two, two elements here is make sure that people understand that the goal is not to get somebody fired, it's to assist these individuals in becoming uh, better, better able to deal with the stressors in their lives and becoming a productive employee once again. Uh, the goal is not to get them fired. That's an absolute last step uh, that's associated with that. The other thing we find is that people are concerned about blowback, and it's important that organizations have an anonymous reporting tool available um, that if they're concerned about somebody, if they don't feel comfortable going to their boss or the person's boss, that they have a way to, to report the concern. And then the companies have to develop appropriate intervention strategies. There's a lot of different things that can cause people to have behavioral changes, a lot of stressors in their lives, whether or not it's it's uh, stress at, at home, sick children, uh, relationships that's dissolving at home, maybe health issues, uh, maybe workplace issues where they feel they've been passed over for promotion, whether or not it's a uh, feeling that they've been passed over due to racial issues or you know they've been there longer, they deserve it, whatever. Uh, finances are a huge stressor. And then religion or ideology, it could be a lot of different things. It could be uh, you know, everything from anti-abortion, anti-fur, anti-whatever, um, and, and obviously with concern of uh, radical Islamic uh, concerns that we've had seen uh, displayed in some of the shooting incidents that have occurred in the U.S. as well. So this pathway to violence, it generally starts out as grievances. And, and this concept that people just snap is, is not accurate. People traverse a, a pathway. Nobody gets up happy, well-adjusted in the morning and, and is killing their coworkers in the afternoon. So the grievance process here is, is not just one grievance. We all have grievances. Usually we can deal appropriately with them and resolve them. It's people that collect grievances. And one of the, one of the things that may indicate that is, is hostile, dark speech, drawings, writings, other expressions. The person's clearly having difficulty coping with, with the stressors. Often they, they blame others. It's rarely their fault, it's somebody else's fault. And when they get to that tipping point of not only do they blame others, but they want others to pay for the problem is that violent ideation point. And we, we used to see your written manifestos, now we're seeing uh, things such as video manifestos, which are trying to essentially coalesce their thoughts into a, a logical rationale of why they have to move forward. Uh, from there, they go on to research and planning, fairly easy on the, the internet. They may be giving signs at that point in time. Uh, Pre-attack preparation, now they're gaining the materials, the access, the uh, how they would get access to the facility, to the individual, mentally rehearsing, and then they often go on to probing and breaching. A uh, key, couple key things here is that one is this is not a one-way street. If we can have appropriate intervention anywhere prior to an attack, we can often you know, try to resolve the stressors, the grievances, and give people the ability to cope. As they continue going to the to the right, the time does become compressed. So if people are surveilling a facility, you have a serious problem on your hand. Uh, it's a major concern if these people should not be there or someone who's been fired who's now hanging out in the parking lot or something like that, uh, a primary concern for you. So some of the indicators, um, expression of suicidal tendencies is clearly one, someone who's uh, saying they can't take it anymore, uh, that carries a lot of grievances. It's not a stretch to think they may take others out on their exit path. Um, previous violence, uh, talking about those incidents, um, sometimes a focus on dangerous weapons, I would say a new focus, unsolicited focus, they bring it up. Paranoia is a key uh, issue here. These people are having difficulty coping. They don't, well work, they don't react well to any type of, of changes in the workplace, uh, often depressed or withdrawn, uh, unstable emotional responses. Uh, sometimes arrogant, sometimes powerless, sometimes in the same sentence. So they may, you know, woe is me, the world, you know, dumps on me. I will get even with you all, all in one sentence. It's, it's truly amazing how you, they may exhibit some of these. Intense anger, um, under behaviors, increased use of alcohol or drugs or going off drugs they've been prescribed. Violations of company policies, these people are pushing boundaries and we need to stop the boundary pushing early on. Otherwise, if you don't react to the boundary pushing and breaking rules, then they have just pushed the boundary and that is now the new accepted policy. So it's very important that the companies have a zero tolerance policy. Increased absenteeism, uh, exploiting, blaming others, it's never their fault. Often they come in looking disheveled, um, unkept because they, 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 they don't care anymore. Uh, they've lost their ability to, to care about that. 
So appropriate intervention um, is to recognize behaviors or most importantly changes in behaviors. There's a lot of people that may, may not be you know, outgoing and gregarious, um, that that's their norm to, to be quiet and withdrawn, that's fine. It's these changes that are the key in the identifying uh, red flags and being willing to report it. And you know, if someone has a bad day, that's fine. If they're normally well adjusted and they're having a bad day or something happened in their life that they're de dealing with, that's fine. But if it's not improving and you continue to see concerning signs, then that's the point in time you want to report. We talked about the threat assessment teams as appropriate intervention. Not only do they have to do that, they need to follow up, not just to do an assessment to determine if it's a legitimate concern and implement a uh, appropriate intervention strategy, they need to go back and follow up. So it's that ongoing outreach and engagement piece. Let's move on to risk analysis. And we could talk for an hour on this slide alone, but risk essentially is the potential for something bad to happen. And we look at three components. One is the threat factor, which is the uh, individual or group that may be uh, providing this, the, uh, the, 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 the risk or the threat picture. Uh, what is what is the vulnerability of our facilities and what do we need to do about that? And then in terms of active shooter or um, those types of, of incidents, what we're looking primarily is people as the consequence. If you had a facility that had nobody in it, while well, they may you know do vandalism or, or harm the facility or whatever, um, we're not looking at people dying there. Conversely, if you have a facility with hundreds or thousands of people, you have a significant potential for a serious event and need to look at, um, while this may be a low probability incident, the consequences could be so high, there's a need to take action. So under, understanding the risk helps you um, prioritize decisions, make a decision if we need to implement solutions or not, uh, helps you identify and compare solutions and allocate resources, uh, rare resources to, to, to do this. All of you have done risk assessments in the past, even if you haven't done it formally, um, you know, you have locks on the doors, you probably have camera systems, you have a lot of things that you've already done. You have done a risk assessment in order to assess what your need is. And part of what we look at doing the risk assessment in the uh, active shooter threat uh, is how many prior incidents have you had? That's how you can, one way you can assess threat. Um, if you're an organization that hasn't had an incident in 20 years, or if you're an organization that's had 20 incidents in the past year, then it'll give you an idea of where you may fit on that uh, the threat profile. So we're looking at the types of business. Um, are you an organization that uh, you know is an abortion clinic or a furry or a meatpacking plant? Are you a you know organization that is a retail establishment? Um, you know one that's open 24/7. Uh, are you are you located in you know in the middle of a um, you know a remote rural area? Are you downtown in a bad part of town? So all these things have a, a weight on this thing. What security do you currently have? And we'll talk more about you know, assessing security and physical security. Do you have that history of disgruntled employees? Do you have a routine process of, of getting people into employee assistance problems based on behavioral issues, concerns? What is the history within your organization? Uh, understanding active shooter incidents can be random, so you can't just say, well, we have no threat, no risk uh, as a result of that. The physical security considerations. Uh, considerations. Um, they're showing you a video on the right hand side. And this video is of a US courthouse parking lot facility. As we know, US courthouse facilities are extremely well secured and it would be, well, never mind. Um, the point is with physical security, uh, you know, it's, it's a bit of an apparition there. Um, incidents that uh, we look at for active shooters and other types of extreme violence occurred in both secured and open facilities. Um, physical security does not provide protection certainly not from the insider threat. Camera systems do not deter active shooters because most of them don't have a viable exit strategy. Um, physical security needs to be paired with appropriate policies and procedures, not telling you guys anything new. Armed guards versus unarmed guards, we could have a multi-hour discussion on this particular topic as well. Um, there needs to be a lot of work done on the risk assessment of the justification for that. Um, there's also those of you that do have armed guards is the perception on the part of employees that armed guards will immediately become SWAT team members and will go and will be uh, taking out the active shooter when oftentimes it's under contracts and the contract says they will assist in evacuation notification and they will assist in getting the law enforcement when they respond to the appropriate location. So it's very important to clarify that all employees understand what is the role of armed guards there. 
obviously building design is going to play a huge role in response to the incident. One of the things we found is over the past few years, uh, we've continually revised our facilities to open floor plans, glass everywhere, all offices, conference rooms all have glass because the risk we've identified that we're protecting from is the threat of sexual harassment. So we're, you know, we're, we're solving the one problem and, and creating another. And, you know, we're solving what we feel is a more uh, likely problem in, in that. One of the things I want to emphasize is that, um, and this is a picture of Aaron Alexis at the Washington Navy Yard shooter. Um, he was a employee who was a contract employee who had access, uh, exhibited clearly schizophrenic behavior a couple of weeks earlier in Newport, Rhode Island. It was reported, but no action was taken. So he had access into the facility. He brings in a sawed off shotgun and a duffel bag. Um, this facility had about as much um, security as you could possibly have. Uh, so physical security itself isn't the solution. Uh, and if you're going to apply these and have these measures, they need to be applied across the board in order to have actual security. You know, And the, the problems, of course, in, in putting all your employees through a magnetometer every day when you have thousands of them as they do there becomes you know, a huge uh, expense to, to, uh, to implement. So looking at your facility, uh, try to look at it from an active shooter and responder perspective. Um, so what are your, you know, as we look at this, we usually do the ring perimeter thing. What are you protecting in the center? What does your exterior look like? I mean, do you have gates? Do you have, you know, fences? Do you have cameras? Uh, you know, look at the windows, you know, all these types of things. Um, one of the key areas I want to emphasize is we need to identify safe refuge areas, even in these large open spaces of cube farms, et cetera. There generally are uh, rooms such as copy rooms, break rooms, storage rooms, um, restrooms that can be used to uh, do sheltering in place if you need to. Another area we need to talk about are those that, you, that are in multi-story high-rise buildings. Uh, what is your plan and policy and procedure? If the shooter's on the third floor, what do you want the people on the fifth floor to do? Often that lockdown uh, of the floors, floor by floor, can be a solution rather than trying to evacuate people uh, down the stairwells past the fifth floor where we know the shooter may be. So a lot to, to discuss and consider there. One of the key issues is exit act of access. And I would urge you when you do your fire drills, block the main exit, uh, block the main uh, egress and, and exit um, and force employees to go out other other ways. It's going to bother some people, but um, we've all gotten in the habit of we can only go in and out one way. Because interior designs are frequently changed, that also provides an opportunity to look at changes that may be assisting you in protecting employees under lockdown, uh, providing sheltering areas, and so forth. Um, also, a lot of law enforcement agencies offer a crime prevention through environmental design review suggest you take advantage of that, not only to get law enforcement to, to give you a separate perspective, but also to get them in your facility to become uh, more familiar. The building populations uh, affect the shooter type, uh, active shooting planning. So we're looking at what is this type of facility? Are you in a you know, highly secured facility or a 24 seven uh, retail location? What are your hours? Um, seasonal occupancy, you know, churches that have um, large congregations on, uh, you know, Easter and Christmas Eve, those types of things, or other high holidays. Um, facility capacity, the larger the facility capacity, again, the greater potential you have for a significant incident, uh, the greater degree you should be, you know, taking to, to examine these issues. And disability populations, do you know that you have a large number of people that are disabled in the facility that would cause you to make sure you're planning for them? Mitigation. Mitigation is anything that's going to lessen the impact of the incident. I think the most important issue in mitigation is immediate notification to all occupants of an active shooter incident. Uh, key critical mitigation activity. A lot of organizations are going to web-based notification services. There's a lot of positive there. You can access those from remotely on, on smartphones, tablets. Uh, you can keep those updated. You can use two-way communications. People can report they're safe, they're injured, whatever. Um, they're excellent tools, but they can't be your only method. You need to use all methods available to you. So um, PA systems, intercom systems, uh, even some places where you can't get notification, people aren't allowed to have cell phones, whatever, they don't use computers. Sometimes you have to literally go person to person to, to notify them. You have to have a plan to notify people. The, we talked about the protective action training. 
you don't know what the most appropriate protective action for them is, the best thing you can do is to tell them where the shooter is, uh, to your knowledge that the incident is occurring, and then it's up to them to make the decision. This is how we tr train and run, hide, fight. Uh, they need to know what to do. Obviously, the first choice is to get out if possible. Second choice, um, you know, if you can't get them out, is to have pre-identified the areas of safe refuge. And fighting is a key element of this thing. I, I'm, I'm so sick and tired of, of watching incident after incident where people sat there waiting to die. Uh, we teach that people working together as a team can distract the shooter by throwing things at them, giving others the opportunity to try to uh, control the risk, working together as a team taking the individual out. And we don't have time to get into the level of training there, uh, but we, we need to, to change the dynamic. Uh, a fire extinguisher discharge in the face is a very good tool. Do you have those in the areas of refuge if someone tries to come into where those are? There's a lot we can do to improve that. Uh, designating shelter locations, we've covered access control, video monitoring system. Um, how are you allowing uh, law enforcement to get into your facility? Uh, are you telling your employees they can give their access cards, the badges, lanyards to law enforcement to give them access to the building? Can you access your video systems remotely so you can meet up as a liaison with law enforcement and say, here, we can see where the shooter is. They need to know where the shooter is now, not five minutes ago. So this integration with responder agencies is a key element in the uh, facility management role. The other essential courses of action, reporting to 911, employees need to know how to do that. The most important thing is where is it occurring? Uh, okay. If you get disconnected, they will send the world. Notification, we've talked briefly about. Evacuation, you need to tell employees where to go, not just to go outside the building, uh, to the flagpole out front, uh, to go across the street. They need to be out of sight of the building. We've had instances where people have gone across the street and been shot and killed because they were inside of the, uh, of the building. Uh, sheltering in place, we've discussed. Emergency responder coordination, uh, access control, how you're gonna get them in. Accountability, you need to be, uh, be able to account for everybody in your building particularly difficult for retail locations where you have people wandering and you have no idea who they are. There's no requirement for them to sign in. This is why video uh, access control is very important to know who's actually there so you don't have 700 people later saying that they were there. Communications management, we'll discuss briefly a little later. Uh, you need to have the capability of getting ahead of this public information cycle on social media, on, on corporate websites and so forth. And then short-term and long-term recovery we'll address in just a minute as well. What's the role of responders on the scene? Basically, they, they have done an excellent job in coordinating nationwide. They are going to go there and eliminate the, the threat. And we've got all kinds of different ways of doing it, all working well. Second thing that they're trying to do is now get a, a lot more uh, care more quickly into the, the site rather than waiting till uh, secondary searches and assessments have been done. So they're using um, police going in with EMTs. They're securing corridors. They're having police drag out victims, uh, patients, and, and also uh, securing rooms that they can bring people to for triage and then extrication. So there's, this is part of why you wanna get in with uh, your responders to have them take a look at your facility, make a decision what may be the best way to manage that. Responder liaison we talked about, it's critical that you have someone coordinating with your responders that's knowledgeable of your facility. Your folks are the logical ones to do that. They know the floor plans. So get the responders in, discuss with them what they would like to see, usually maps, master keys, or access badges, uh, sometimes Sharpies for marking doors. Um, as, as they go down the hall, they often will wedge a door shut behind them, so if there's a shooter in there, they can't open it easily and come in behind them. Some are requesting additional tourniquets, tourniquets quick clots, um, you know, the trauma dressings, that type of thing. If you have a radio system that you use or security, uh, try to have one of those available and, and discuss with them whatever else they would like to see. What is the coordination with that? So we've got coordination of public information we talked about. Following the incident, you need trained spokespeople that have the authority to, to speak for the organization. Uh, they need to pre-designate public information messages. You've got to get ahead of this thing. You've got to be able to do it on multiple sites. You can't start a Twitter feed the day of the incident, uh, as anyone else can spoof a Twitter feed as well. You need to be able to speak on your website to be able to release information. If you don't do this, you will be so far behind the curve, it's, it's incredibly difficult. You also need to communicate internally. You need to keep people notified of what's the status of the incident. Police are on the scene 
police have, have secured the, the, the building, police will be conducting a secondary search where we want you to go. Um, all these things need to be done, accountability. All this has to be part of your, your information and communication strategy. Talked about active uh, or inclusive planning considerations for persons that need um, to be notified. You may have people that are blind or, or um, hearing disabled, may not speak English. Talk with them, determine what is the best way to, to provide identification. Um, you may have people that uh, need supervision, either young people that are children that need to be supervised, older people that uh, may have autism or other uh, issues. You may have people that have deer in the headlights look that need to be led to safety. So another area where often the buddy system is very effective. And those with mobility impairments, both short and long-term, someone who broke their ankle last week versus someone who's been in a wheelchair for, for several years. So talk with them. You will hear them to say everything from don't touch me, I'll take care of myself to forget the wheelchair, throw me over your shoulder, drag me out of here. Um, so you need to have that communication to discuss with them what is the most appropriate way to handle it. The recovery, both short term, we have to find a location for these people to go to to get in out of the hot and the cold, uh, to have psychological first aid, family reunification, food and water. Um, you've got to take care of the immediate needs of your people. And then longer term, we're going to looking at getting your business back open. You may not have your facility for several days. When you get it, it's not going to be you know cleaned up. You're going to have to, to manage that. What's the game plan? Who's going to do it? Um, do you contract that out as the recommendation? Uh, we've got to continue things such as grief counseling for an extended period of time. You've got to get your operations back up and running. You're going to be doing that without a lot of employees because many will not come back if they do not feel the facility is safe. Um, thank goodness, you know, people will start scamming fraud awareness. You know, human nature as it is, the scams will pop up almost immediately. And then you've got to document exactly what happened because you're going to have either civil, civil trials uh, or, or criminal trials as well. So a lot of things going on, you've got to have a recovery plan. Develop checklists for your people. Who's gonna deploy these things? What are the immediate actions? What are the numbers that need to be called and notified? Those types of things. There's a lot of training material that's out there uh, already. DHS has a lot of material. There's a website reference on here. Uh, DHS um, Active Shooter is the most visited website on the DHS um, of all their websites. A lot of good information and materials there. They've got some video training. Uh, I encourage you to incorporate this as part of your training. Don't just show them a DHS video and consider it trained. There's a lot more. The training needs to be tailored to your facility, your employees. Um, there's some independent study courses that are listed here. Very good. The IS907 is excellent. The workplace security awareness, also excellent programs. There's a lot here that you all can do on your side to train and also look at the development of training and how the training would be delivered to employees. But coordinating exercises, um, a key way to evaluate this. It's important that you conduct exercises. You can start small with an evacuation exercise, a notification exercise, um, working way up to uh, the discussion exercises we talked earlier with senior leadership in the uh, response. You need to have threat assessment exercises. There's a lot to do here, but essentially this is how you can continue to improve your plan. So that's it. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Todd. Hello. Yes, Dave. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dave. Thank you, Dave, very much. Uh, and thank you all for sending in your questions. We will be getting to those uh, shortly. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, uh, before we get to Q&A, we're going to see uh, a demo of a solution from ARC Facilities, and Todd Moore from ARC will be showing that to you momentarily. You'll be seeing it on your screen soon. And he's going to conduct a demo of, a, of an app, a technology that ARC Facilities offers for facility management professionals to aid them in um, emergency situations such as been discussed today. So that'll be on your screen shortly, and then we'll jump into the Q&A. So we look forward to that as well. So thank you, Dave, and Todd, we'll look forward to that demo. Okay, that okay. sounds good, Anne. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dave. You. Uh, Anne, can you, can you see my screen? Uh, no, I cannot, actually. We have the welcome screen, so we just need to see your demo up there. Okay. Let's see. I'll let you know when it's up. There we go. Oh. We are, I can see your screen, um, but I don't see your demo screen yet. Alrighty. Okay. 
So and there we you, go. Uh, it's showing. Can you see me now? I see it now. I see Valley Medical. So, okay. Uh, yeah, take it away. Thank you. All right, Ann. Uh, thank you very much, Dave. Uh, thank you. You know, very, very interesting uh, uh, conversation. Um, so, again, when we, you know, when we listen to Dave and we, you know, listen to all of the, the information that he had to talk about, you know, one of the things that came to mind, especially with, with uh, one of the points that he brought, you know, was the essential course of action. So, you know, with the essential course of action, you know, where is this information being kept and, and, and how is it being updated? And probably more importantly, how is it being accessed? You know, I talk to a lot of folks and, and those folks are, are employing binders, three ring binders that are scattered throughout the office. Uh, sometimes they're employing uh, flip charts and whatnot that are hung outside of office doors and department doors. So, you know, I would challenge you to kind of think about that in a different way. So on the screen, you know, you see, uh, you know, a, a demo site here for Valley Medical and, and all the icons you see there is emergency. So if I touch on my emergency button, you know, now what we see is really a campus view. You know, these are all of my buildings that I have emergency information for. So again, for somebody that's in the medical center, you know, by simply touching on number four or touching on the building uh, 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 labeled number four, it gets me to this essential course of action, you know, kind of like Dave talked about. You know, what if I needed to know, you know, what do I do in case of a fire? What do I do in case of a flood? If you look at the bottom of the screen where I have action plans, if I simply touch on the action plans, now you can see all of the different action plans. And, you know, for example, I can touch on uh, evacuation. And when I do, it tells me exactly what that evacuation protocol, you know, is, you know, for my particular building. So, you know, once again, if we go back to the concept that I may be in a couple of different buildings throughout the day, that maybe I'm on different floors throughout the day, you know, this will tell you exactly what you need to know. One of the other things that I, that I picked up from, uh, from Dave's talk, you know, was the fact that interior design frequently changes. You know, plan may need updating. We need to notify responders if floor plans are reconfigured or actually not if, but when they're reconfigured. So once again, by using an app, by using a, you know, a platform, all of that now can be easily done. And when that is done, essentially give access to everybody. So one of the things that I look at, one of the things that our customers look at, you know, is what is probably the one most, you know, single important tool that they have that almost everybody has all the time, their cell phone, their smartphone, you know, maybe two smartphones and an, and an iPad or a tablet. So again, you know, this, this little piece of, of amazing communication, you know, can do so many things. So, you know, just as quickly, I can now, for example, touch on my floor plans button. When I touch on my floor plans button, where do I need to go? What do I need to look at? I need to look at my first floor. And, you know, here it is. You know, here's the floor plan for that particular floor. And it's very easy now, you know, to zoom in and pan around that. One of the things that we encourage is now sharing this information with the first responders. So now if the first responder has access to this information as they're coming on the scene, instead of once they get on the scene, you know, they're able to react to that to plan for that just that much faster. One of the things that we're also able to do is if I have an idea where the bad guy is, now I can use my tools and I can indicate, okay, you know, this is where my bad guy is. And then I can quickly communicate that by simply hitting my send button, hitting my current view, and then being able to text that to somebody or email that to somebody. So once again, from a communications perspective, you know, we're keeping everybody on the same page, you know, very simple, very easy to get to. And just as quickly now, I'm back into, into my emergency dashboard. Some of the other things that, that we may need to do is shutoffs. So once my first responders come on to site, you know, I need to perhaps shut off electric. You know, what if there was a gas leak? What if there's a water leak? You know, what if they were trying to, you know, to do something bad or sabotage my building? 
once again, I or my first responders would simply be able to touch on the shutoffs, touch on the floor that I'm currently on. In this case, I'll touch on my first floor. And when I do that, you can see the numerous little red dots that I have scattered around here. You know, so some may be indicative of my electric. So I can now touch on an electric panel and I can see all of the information that's on that electric panel and the various things that it's going to turn off or going to control. You know, what if there's water free flowing? I can now touch on a water valve and see exactly how to shut off that water valve. You know, in the case of a gas leak or problem with gas, or maybe I want to turn off that gas, once again, I'm able to see exactly what that looks like. So, you know, what we're doing is, you know, in the case of a crisis, now I'm able to really share this information with anybody and now allow them to go and do what they need to very quickly, you know, to, you know, to deal with that. One of the other things that I thought Dave said was interesting is, you know, in the case of, of uh, you know, of fighting, you know, the very last step, if I need to fight, you know, he had mentioned discharging a fire extinguisher in somebody's face. You know, that really speaks directly to our emergency equipment map. So if I touch on my emergency equipment map and touch on, once again, my first floor equipment maps, now you are able to see all of these different places where I have all of my emergency equipment, but I can now kind of isolate that view by simply touching on view. I can turn everything off and then scroll down just to my fire extinguishers, and now I can see the locations of my fire extinguishers. So once again, if I determine from my safe refuge area that I'm here you know, by the vestibule, by the vending machines, you know, maybe by the, you know, by the reception here, I can see where these fire extinguishers are. You know, in the case of, of harm or whatnot, you know, I can expand this. I can look obviously now for AEDs. I can look for emergency kits. I can look for anything that's going to be applicable. So, you know, just to kind of wrap up here, you know, the essential courses of action, I have all of the information that I'm going to need from an informational perspective. You heard Dave talk about safe refuge areas. You've heard him talk about evacuation routes. You heard him talk about floor plans and action plans and shutoffs. And now from this one dashboard, I'm really able to access all of that information. And the great part is, it's all now on my mobile device. It's it's on my smartphone. And and let's face it, you know, when we get up and when we leave our desks, when we're walking from place to place, building to building, floor by floor, what's the tool that we always have with us? We always have our mobile phone. And in this case, we have all of the relevant information for all of my emergency information. And I will turn it back to you. Okay, thank you, Todd. Thank you very much. Uh, so I do, I do have a question or two for you, and, and Dave, I'd ask you to, um, if you can put the slide deck back up, because I know we're going to get into some questions for you as well. And we have um, some slides at the end there where if we're going to talk about the, the ARC app for a few moments, because I do have some questions on that, uh, I just wanted to show the audience uh, what that looks like on the uh, smartphone setting, for instance, as Todd had just discussed. So if you can put up that slide, Dave, that would be great. And in the meantime, Todd, I am going to jump into a question for you. Uh, you had talked about the, you know, the ARC facilities app and shown some things there for emergency preparedness and, um, you know, and other facility facility um, operations. So my question to you specifically is, you had mentioned communication right, right there, um, and you mentioned first responders. So the question is, are you able to communicate um, with not only first responders but also um, colleagues within the organization, whether it's your facilities department or others, so does this afford you that communication during an event, um, perhaps a violent event? How does that work? Yes, yes, it would. So, you know, once again, uh, with with really any and all information here, you know, I have the ability to mark up or annotate uh, plans uh, as far as where an emergency might be happening or the part of, bu of the building it's happening in. You know, I can very easily now text that, you know, to somebody or even email that to somebody. You know, the other piece that we often talk about is sharing this information. So, you know, it's very easy to share now with, with a simple username and password. Now everybody can ultimately have access to that 
including the first responders that are coming into site. So again, sharing the information is made easy, you know, either through a text or email protocol, or even ultimately just sharing that uh, that application or sharing that building an emergency information with a first responder that may be coming onto site. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, did have a, another question or two for you. Just uh, we did have some interest in specifics on on the uh, ARC app. So I wanted to ask you. Um, just to understand how information gets into that app, if a, a facility wanted to work with you to get that app, um, who uploads that vast amount of information to even start with? Um, you know, how is that collaboration? Um, and then secondly, uh, just a second point, if all the services are down in an emergency event, uh, can you still use this app? How does that you know, link in? I know this is yeah, a different question. absolutely. Yeah, no, absolutely. Relative. No. Um, so again, how's you know how's the information get put in? You know, that's that's one of the great things about our 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 platform overall, and then our app. Again, there's a lot of intelligence within the platform. Um, so when plans are loaded, either by Arc facilities folks or by the customer themselves, you know that information is now being you know organized to a point. You know, it's it's being linked. Um, you know, OCR data is, is being pulled from it, links are being created, um, and, and essentially, you know, navigating from point A to, to point B to point C. So normally that is a, you know, that's a, a function of ARC. Uh, that's what ARC facilities will do in order to, to help the customer. Again, we are going to deploy something that's fully functional from day one. Again, keeping it up the same way, you know, as I mentioned, as Dave mentioned, you know, interior design, it's, it's changing all of the time. Buildings and, and floor plans are changing all of the time. So, you know, it's important to keep the information as current as can be. And once again, our facilities can do that or the customer can do that. Or quite frankly, we can work together to make sure that everything is being kept current. As far as the second part of the question, you know, what if, you know, what if Wi-Fi is down? You know, what if cell signal is down? You know, the entire emergency app, the emergency platform that I uh, that I demonstrated, you know, can be available offline as well. So that can be synchronized down to a smartphone, you know, either Apple, iOS, or Android, or even uh, a laptops or tablets to be able to use that in an offline capability. So, you know, once internet comes back up, once Wi-Fi or, or cell or data comes back up, it will reconnect to the cloud and resynchronize from the cloud. But in the case that all communications are down, I am still able to use that in an offline capability. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and then, so we will we'll go back to um, you know, the the broad issue at hand. Now we'll we'll bring Dave back in. Um, thank you, Todd, very much. Um, I wanted to get some of these questions covered that we did get in the beginning of the or uh, the uh, presentation as well. So um, let's jump right in. Obviously, either of you gentlemen are are um, you know welcome to to answer this. So let's see. Um, so, so Dave, I, I would think this question's for you. It's specific to your presentation, uh, and it's about the uh, threat management team that I believe you showed a pyramid of kind of five elements and some of the players that would be in, involved in that. So the question was, for what size of a company or organization do you recommend having a threat management team? So is that dependent on the size of an organization if they have that in place, have you found? Yeah, the, the, the standard doesn't specify the size of an organization, but realistically, uh, it is difficult for smaller companies to have a, you know, a full threat management capability. Um, this is not a dedicated group of individuals. This is a group of individuals that have specific training that come together at a regular period of time to address any incidents that have come up that need to be done. Also, they should be coming together to follow up on any prior incidents. Uh, the key here is that the, the uh, threat management team is provided training from someone who is uh, certified to do so that is outside the organization. Um, there is no set number. Uh, obviously, if your organization has never had a problem, you may, you know, uh, not see a need to do that. But quite frankly, um, the whole concept here is prevention, uh, not response. So uh, that's where we want to focus our, our efforts. And and the the cost of the, the training, um, you know, can be had for as probably as little as ten or twelve thousand dollars for a couple days of training. Plus, obviously, the cost of your people. Uh, spending the time in, in doing that. You don't need 40 people on a threat management team at any level of the organization. Um, larger companies often will have a corporate uh, threat management team that then is available to local um, facility managers, 
local um, HR staff and, and that type of thing. So it can be done a lot of different ways. And I'll stay on that training topic for a moment. Uh, and you had just mentioned a cost, so I, I might guess the answer to this. But is it, the question is, is this training mandatory um, by OSHA it's or other go government opportunity yeah. entities? No, the, 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 as we indicated previously, OSHA, um, it, the, well, let's put it the other way, the American uh, National Standard for Workplace Violence Prevention and Intervention is, is not a mandatory standard. However, it is a standard of care. So organizations that have gone through the processes that are listed there um, have a much greater chance of uh, not being found liable for an incident occurring if they've taken the uh, the logical you know, the steps that are identified in the, in the standard. OSHA says you have to provide a, work, a place of workplace that is free from recognizable hazards that are likely to cause harm or injury. So that is the law. Um, the, the national guidance, which is a standard of care, duty of care, um, specifies the threat assessment team. Thank you. And, uh, and then we'll stay on the training and drill, um, more of a drill um, topic, a question, I'm sorry. And the question is, um, how do you measure the effectiveness of an active, sh active shooter drill? Okay, well, there's a, a number of different wills. First of all, there's, there's a lot of different types of drills you can have. So we talked about a notification drill, in which case the goal is 100% notification. Uh, we talk about uh, exit drills, uh, egress drills, uh, making sure that people go out and, and exit uh, you know, away uh, separately. You can time those in the, in the same way we're timing fire drills and that type of thing. When we get into other larger drills, such as tabletops and whatnot, um, we measure the effectiveness the, is how many problems have you found. A, a good exercise is one in which a number of issues have been identified that can be corrected. So a bad exercise is a good exercise because it's identified a lot of issues that can be you know, addressed and, and resolved. So there is no you know, standard measurement of these things that, that I'm aware of. Uh, it depends entirely on the type of exercise. Many organizations <clears throat> will not gonna go past a tabletop exercise because of the expense of doing so. Um, we're currently, we've done some very large full-scale exercises. Uh, it's absolutely critical that in order to have a successful one, that this is coordinated thoroughly with local law enforcement, local responders, um, that we don't have surprises even then you know, even just mentioning in an email to, to people that they're going to conduct an exercise, some people have literally picked up the phone and dialed 911. It's very important that this be well shared uh, throughout the organization to neighboring businesses uh, and that local responders are, are tied into a, a larger exercise, and you know, full-scale exercise as well. So hope that answers the question. And again, if my, my information is there. If anybody has a question that I haven't answered, feel free to get in touch with me. I'm happy to answer you know, or, or further answer any of these. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Todd, I'm going to jump back to you because I did have a question about um, the app, the ARC app, and something Dave just mentioned in terms of first responders being looped in. Uh, so the question that had come in is how can the ARC facilities app information um, be shared with uh, a first responder en route to a facility? So in the, you know, in the, the heat of an event, um, how does that work in terms of communicating with a first responder? Is that possible? Yeah, absolutely. It can uh, it can be shared. In fact, in a couple of different ways. Again, the the first way and and what we you know what we kind of train for on deployment is to make the first responders part of the contact list, get them usernames and passwords, so that they always have access to the most current information. You know, but the the second way is you know URLs can be sent. Um, so if during an active uh, issue, uh, uh, active site, um, you know, something needs to be sent for to a first responder, a URL uh, can be sent, which can be opened, you know, via, via a text message or via an email. Um, and, and really, thirdly, we can take pictures. And, and again, as I've showed within the app, if I would bring up a picture of a floor plan and annotate on top of that floor plan, you know, I can send that as an actual image uh, to, a, to a cell phone or, or to a laptop computer, either via text or email. So there's a couple of different strategies to share that information, you know, even uh, when a first responder is en route. Okay, thank you. Thanks for explaining that further. Um, and then let's see, um, we have a, a number of good questions and I do want to mention, we'll go for several more minutes uh, because we do have some good questions, but I also did want to mention that if we don't get to your questions, um, Dave or Todd will be able to adjust them with you offline. So 
um, please note you please know you will get an answer um, if you would like one. So let's see the next question. Um, I work for a large gym chain, a chain of gyms, workout facilities. Where can I find information specific to making my locations safe, um, whether relative to gyms or maybe um, you know that type of um, you know environment where people are coming in and out? Listen, Dave, let me uh, just say that uh, I don't know of one specific to gyms. I know that the Department of Homeland Security, through the Critical Infrastructure Branch, Security Branch, um, is working on a number of uh, more specific guidance. They have one for houses of worship. They have one for assembly, larger assemblies, such as stadiums and, and uh, coliseum type of, of uh, events. Uh, the I'm not aware of national guidance on you know, gym use, things like that. Obviously, um, you know, I, I, I consult, I'm happy to, to speak with them and, and provide some guidance. One of the things that works well is to identify a plan that will work with one of your facilities and then apply that, uh, that template, if you will, to other facilities for them to address the same issues uh, that would then need to be addressed at their facility, but maybe different based on their location or configuration. Okay, thank you. And let's see, we'll have a few more here. Oh, okay, this is um, an interesting question. Our, our sheriff's office tells me that active shooter standing operating procedure and drills are their responsibility. How does facility management stay involved? Have you, have you run oh, into that question. scenario? Oh, great question. Um, the, the answer is, is that many of the uh, law enforcement and responder agencies are required to conduct the drills either annually or, or biannually. Um, and they are always looking for facilities to conduct these drills. So if you have interest in doing this, um, discuss with local responders early. Uh, often the time frame for their planning is, is a year out, um, almost always well over six months out. So if you have an interest in conducting that and getting their involvement, um, your willingness to offer your facility, and it doesn't have to be during working hours, it can be evenings, weekends, holidays, whatever, um, may be a, a very good way to, to broach that. Um, you know, look very concerned about, you know, and most companies are disrupting production or, or you know, their, their operations for a period of what is likely to be several hours. Um, you may have some of your employees that are willing to serve as actors uh, coming in as, as, you know, as serving as employees or actors uh, to participate in the drill. There's a lot of different ways that can happen, but the, the key thing there is if you're interested in conducting that, at your facility, coordinate with local law enforcement, uh, and, and you know, let them know your willingness to discuss further use of your facility. Okay, thank you. And uh, let's see, we'll take we'll take two more questions, and I, I do appreciate all these questions that are coming in. This is great, um, uh, Todd. Uh, this would be for you. Can the the um, Arc Facilities app link with um, the security and other surveillance systems that are in a facility? Uh, so can that app be linked in and connected with other systems to have direct access or real-time observation on facilities conditions in a time, you know, in, in a time of need? So can that be linked in to be used for, for emergency preparedness or, uh, situations? Sure. Uh, the answer is probably. Um, you know, normally from from our standpoint, uh, you know, from our app standpoint, uh, we do have open APIs, which which really means we support integrations with other like applications that have open APIs as well. You know, but from a from a kind of a more simplistic standpoint, you know, let's take uh, cameras, security cameras, the security cameras that may be hooked up through a through our URL based cloud based system or even an IP based system. Yes, uh, I am able to you know simply put url addresses or ip addresses you know even if they need to be authenticated you know attached to that particular camera i can touch on a camera and really be able to tap into the you know to the feed of of that camera so um yes that one's pretty uh, pretty easy to uh, to do as far as integrating with other applications once again uh i i've kind of say our application is like switzerland we talk to everybody so as long as the application that you're looking to integrate with has open APIs as well, then likely, yes, we can integrate with them. Okay, thank you. And I'll put this last question out to, to both of you, uh, gentlemen. What is the best way to get uh, buy-in from a reluctant administration, um, meaning you know, buy-in to these 
to drills, to regular drills, to the the whole, um, you know, five-point uh, planning process that you had mentioned, Dave. Um, have you run into, either of you run into, you know, facilities people uh, that have run into reluctance from their administration, but they want to get these, you know, programs in place and improved. So um, any ways that you can kind of talk yeah. to points you could make, be able to offer? Yeah, Todd, this is Dave. Let me, I'll take the first crack at this. Um, several you. ways you can you can go about this and we could talk for about an hour on this topic but key first one i would say is it's, it's it's very difficult to push this planning and preparedness process uphill you really do need to have the buy-in from the top senior leadership um, some of the ways you get that is the reason i put that osha uh guidance up there or osha um, ruling there uh, general duty clause and also the national preparedness um, guidance that's, that's that's out there so those are two key reasons other ones is a desire to protect your employees. Um, you know, the, this this is very enabling to employees to be able to um, make sure that they know how to keep themselves safe. So you get buy-in from your employees that you know know the company is spending money to to do this, and, and it's generally really appreciated. So there's a lot of different levels we can approach this this on. Um, conducting an exercise if they're willing to do that is usually a real eye-opener for them. And they realize that if they don't have a good plan and aren't prepared, then the likelihood of the business surviving an attack like this is, is very low. Uh, so there's there's a lot of different ways to approach it, and I'd be happy to talk particularly with, with anyone else. Todd? Thank you. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Uh, uh, we've, we've actually had a couple of our customers come to us because they had done uh, mock drills. Um, and they've, they've, you know, just internal mock drills, and they found that they failed them miserably uh, because they didn't have access to the information. Um, so, you know, again, you know, looking for access and a good practical application, you know, is one of those ways. You know, we often, you know, take a look from a from a productivity standpoint, you know, from a value standpoint. Um, you know, how quickly can we have access to this information? How how easy is it to share this information? Um, and and, and again, Again, you know, once the, the the folks up the food chain see that, you know, realize that, you know, that's something they definitely want to put in place, you know, for their employees and for their business workplace in, in its entirety. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. With that, we will wrap it up. Um, thank you again, Dave and Todd, for uh, participating and for your presentations today. And I also want to thank ARC Facilities for sponsoring this webinar. And of course, to our audience for attending today. As I mentioned, your questions uh, can be answered offline, um, so please look out for that as well. Uh, a recording of the webinar will be available online uh, at facilityexecutive.com, also on the ARC Facilities website, that's www.e-arc.com, or on Dave's website, Homeland Security Consulting, and that's homelandsecurityconsulting.net. Um, so thank you again. On a last note, I wanted to mention that uh, Dave Hunt will be speaking this Thursday in Arlington, Virginia at Facility Executive Live. That's a conference put on by Facility Executive Magazine. So if you're interested in hearing from him and some other speakers in the FM world, uh, you can visit facilityexecutivelive.com and register today. It does close today, registration. Thank you again. Have a great afternoon.